so uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome to the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry webinar. Uh, this is Linda Mirza. I'm a pediatric dentist consultant and one of the board member of the SSPD. Uh, it's my pleasure to host uh, this webinar tonight. Uh, in this webinar, we are hosting two distinguishable speakers, Dr. Eraldo Pesarisi and Dr. Noor Hadi. Uh, uh, this webinar is organized by the SSPD, Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry, in collaboration with Kunuz Ritaj, a communication and event management company. Uh, it's my pleasure to host uh, this session tonight with Dr. Hudun Qalai. Uh, Dr. Hudun is a periodontist in Armed Force Hospital in Dahran. He is the program director of Saudi Pediatric Dentistry Board in King Abdul Aziz Air Base Hospital in Jeddah. Good evening, Dr. Hudun. It's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Binda. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Uh, now I will take the privilege to introduce our first speaker tonight, Dr. Eraldo Peserisi. Dr. Eraldo is a junior faculty of Dental School of San Martin de Forest University in Lima, Peru. He's a member of the International Association for Dental Research. He graduated in Federico Villarreal University in Lima, Peru at 2009. Then he completed his master in dentistry in San Martin de Forest University in Lima, Peru at 2015. Uh, he had his PhD in Medical Science, Oral Global Health in Radboud University in Netherlands at 2019. Dr. Pesarisi will talk today about interdisciplinary approaches for caries prevention in public health. Before I will give the mic to Dr. Pesarisi, I would like to announce that we are hosting a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So feel free to write any question you want to ask in the Q&A uh, section in the bottom of the screen. We will address them to the speaker at the end of each presentation. Uh, Dr. Eraldo, good morning. I think it's about 11.30 in Lima. So good morning and uh, buenos dias. Buenos dias and salam aleikum. Thank you so much for the kind invitation, Dr. Linda. It's a great pleasure for me to share this presentation with colleagues from the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry. I don't have the honor of being a pediatric dentist myself, but I have been involved in some research projects related to public health with children. So many people think I am a pediatric dentist. My heart is close to the speciality, uh, to the speciality but I am a general dentist involved in research with public health uh, initiatives. And that's what I would like to share with you today. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have with you. You are so welcome. Bian Vendos, and the mic is yours. Uh, kindly, you can start your presentation. Uh, for me, I'm so excited, excited to attend, and I wish you all the uh, good luck, and I'm sure that the audience will have a great and beneficial time with your presentation. Thank you so much, and again, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm honored to share this uh, Presentation is part of my PhD research about interdisciplinary approaches for caries prevention from a public health perspective. Uh, my name is Geraldo Pesaresi. I work in the San Martin University in Lima, Peru. Uh, I'm a professor in research, but in the area of public health. And uh, my journey of academic life started in the public university where I studied my undergraduate years. Then I follow a master's degree in dentistry and finally I had the chance to work together with Dr. Joe Franken in Hadbald University in the Netherlands and I was uh, extremely fortunate to, hit, to have these two great masters in, in dentistry. Dr. Rita Villena, she is the head of the pediatric dentistry department in the university that I work and together with Dr. Franken we were able to conduct a five-year project of research uh, together with uh, other healthcare professionals. So I would like to start this webinar by sharing with you this uh, philosophy of minimal intervention dentistry. Uh, 
this is something that could be applied both in the private practice but also in the public health agenda is uh, basically orientated uh, around these five principles an early diagnosis starting with a risk assessment of every every single individual trying to tailor the strategies for each patient individually a remuneration of enamel and dentine lesions prevention of dental caries progression uh, understanding that the dental caries disease is a dynamic process and if these three early steps fail or we, if we arrive late into the life of the individual we could opt to use minimally invasive restorative care try to repair and polish the previously performed restoration to reduce what some researchers have called the uh, spiral of death of the or the repetitive restorative cycle in dentistry uh, here i would like to make a difference between what is understood by minimal intervention dentistry is a more a, a holistic concept and many people confuse it with minimally invasive dentistry or preparing small holes into the tooth structure and it's not the same thing the minimal intervention dentistry is a more holistic, including public health agenda, including prevention of dental caries, changing habits uh, regarding diet and oral hygiene. And minimally invasive dentistry is only uh, as related to the operative process itself. So it's a procedure more than a philosophy. So this is the main difference between these couple of concepts. We have to be aware that dental care is now is a global pandemic. It's a health care uh, issue around the globe. Unfortunately, we are leading the rankings of the most prevalent diseases of mankind. And this is unfortunate because uh, during the early years of life, uh, children are uh, getting these high peaks of untreated dental care uh, based on this meta regression, where we see that the slope is quite high during the first years of life. This is basically due to many factors, mainly related with the, what it's so-called occidental diet, with a diet more rich in sugars and industrialized foods that have all these added components that uh, at the end of the day, unfortunately, are translated into more burden of disease. Uh, part of the problem of this uh, scenario is that for decades, dentistry has considered dental caries as an infectious disease, which is required, which required to eliminate the infected tissue or the infected uh, structure to cure the disease. And I put this between columns because the, we were considering that the bacteria is the problem, but we are very far from the truth. Uh, this concept of the infectious disease came from the studies from Keys in the 1960s where they were only able to uh, detect some types of bacteria in the oral cavity and they made a conclusion based on preliminary findings or limited tools they have back then. Today, based on this consensus uh, of terminology and understanding of dental caries process, we know that dental caries is defined as a dynamic, biofilm-mediated, diet-modulated, multifactorial, non-communicable disease resulting in the mineral loss of dental heart tissues. It is determined by many factors such as biological, behavioral, psychosocial, and environmental. So we need to understand that this is a dynamic process, but as a consequence of a behavior that is diet, sugars, and bad oral hygiene, among others. Uh, something that we need to differentiate as well is that the dental caries disease is not the same as dental caries lesion. I don't know if in Saudi Arabia happens the same, but here we are very used to go to the dentist and put uh, ourselves in the dental chair, and the dentist told us, well, you have five caries, or you have six caries, and we have to treat them. And it's not like that. We have the disease, dental caries, and the lesions are the manifestation or the signs of a disease. So restoring a cavitated lesion will not cure the disease. And this is something that we are understanding more and more during the last decades. Uh, however, the historical management of dental caries 
is based on the use of a handpiece, not only to treat patient, but in some cases only, or also to diagnose when there's a doubt of the uh, a dark uh, lesion, could be a carious lesion instead of a, a stain. Many dentists use the drill to confirm that diagnosis, and this is quite unfortunate. Today we know that the main theory behind dental caries etiology is this one proposed by Philip Marsh in 1994 that is called the ecological plague theory. This stipulates that there's a, a great amount of bacteria in every single mouth. We are calculating 200 types per individual, but many of them are beneficial for us or are at least symbiotic. That means that they are, they are present, but the presence of bacteria does not translate into the disease itself. We have, however, a triggering factor that is the increase of sugary drinks and snacks that will create a domino effect. With this increased sugary drinks, we will change or imbalance the bacterial families and that will cause a dysbiosis that will end up into the progression or the manifestation and progression of the disease. So sugar is the enemy. Sugar, not only for oral health, but also for other diseases such as diabetes, obesity, kidney failure, and some types of cancer. So we have to work together with other healthcare professionals in order to reduce as much as possible the consumption of sugary drinks and snacks. And this is something that is quite well documented during the last couple of years in some agreements and manifestation by the WHO, for instance, where there are clear correlations between the pattern of consumption of sugary drinks and snacks and the oral health consequences translated into dental caries. So the high consumers are also the high uh, caries prevalence uh, individuals. So there is a lot written about diet in caries progression, but unfortunately, this is not translated into the education. We are not taught how to deal with diet in the dental school. And the importance of the sugar guidelines of WHO has been recently highlighted in this publication by Dr. Joao Breda, where they are in line with the recommendation of WHO to reduce the consumption of uh, sugar, especially during the first years of life. Some studies in Brazil have been uh, confirming this data, especially regarding the pattern of pH uh, drops around the day. They are claiming that the critical number if, is five uh, events of sugary drinks or snacks during the day. And this is mainly related to this uh, pattern of drops and recovering of pH around the day. If we have many drops around the day, we will not have the buffer capacity by the saliva to recover those levels and return the mineral loss to the tooth structure because it took like up to three hours for the saliva to recover that physiological pH. So when we have more than five events, you will see that we have a patient in risk. In that line of thinking, there's a systematic review on the effect of, of caries of restricted sugar intake. And that's why there are recommendations about the, the limit, the consumption of 10% of the daily energy in a 2000 calorie diet that will represent 200 calories. That is the approximate amount you find in a small package of cookies. So we have to translate this, this information into a practical advice for our parents or our patients. And today we have the advantage of many tools that will are, uh, assess the individual risk, such as the camera or karyogram, in which diet will play a main role into what is called the balance of pathological and physiological factors. This kind of risk assessment tools will allow us to categorize our patients into different groups, extreme, high, medium or low, as proposed by the group of Dr. John Featherstone in the University of California, 
And from the age of six, we could put them into this kind of categories to advise them around one year, for example, in an extreme risk. And then if after one year, they have improved their diet behaviors and their hygiene, we could reduce the risk to high and the next year to medium and the next year to low. So it's very difficult to put from extreme to low risk because we, don't, uh, we are not able to make that big of a jump. But the opposite could happen. For example, if we have a low, re low risk patient that unfortunately suffers from head, and neck, head or neck cancer, this radiation will uh, end up damaging the production of saliva and that immediately will take this patient into an uh, extreme risk scenario. Recently, we have been able to have these consultation meetings with the WHO experts regarding early childhood caries, in which there are a rec series of recommendations around the strategies to prevent the manifestation of ECC, the early childhood caries pandemic, the prevalence among children as early as the preschool age is quite high in many countries and Latin America and the Middle East is not the exception. So we see that unfortunately many parents take their children to the dental clinic when it's too late, when they require high complicated and expensive treatments and even then the disease will not be cured because we are not changing the behavior. So the ECC pattern globally actually presents itself at as early as the age of two and it develops rapidly because we know that the mineralized content of primary teeth are not as hard or are not as resistant as the permanent teeth scenario. So we have to consider risk assessment included socioeconomical variables, behavioral variables, and in some cases, if possible, microbiological factors, but we know that the main art billion is sugar. In the discussion of this consultation of the WHO, there have been comprehensive disease management recommendations with primary prevention, secondary prevention, and <clears throat> minimal intervention treatments such as the uh, traumatic restorative treatment or the use of silver diamine fluoride. But together with the patient as a main a stakeholder into the prevention of the disease incorporated a daily brushing with fluoride toothpaste. Here, it's important to highlight that the amount of this fluoridated toothpaste in 1000 ppm for public health agenda will be uh, the size of a rice uh, or a smear when, when we have children from six months to two years a pea size for from two years to six years, and then all the extension of the pediatric toothpaste or some uh, colleagues uh, recommend to use the transversal technique, the width of the toothbrush for the rest of the childhood. So ma the main recommendation from this agreement came up as uh, the integration of oral health into general health agendas to train non-dental healthcare professionals to be allies into the reduction of the burden of disease and to establish economic incentives. That's one of the, the barriers. We are not get paid to give advice on diet. We are get paid to perform restorations or sealants and we are not uh, re rewarding uh, with a salary or uh, in economic incentive the education factor or the monitoring of diet. So that's part of the issue. So there has been some suggestion in the literature to incorporate this bridge of dental and medical professionals with many models in the US. We have also some models in Canada and in Australia that are quite uh, motivating for working with nurses, working with pediatricians, working with dental hygienists, working with midwives to try to incorporate the general health or the oral health into general health uh, strategies. That was part of our research, uh, reason why I uh, obtained my degree in the Netherlands. And we conducted this five-year project 
that was called the impact of primary healthcare providers on reducing carious lesions development in infants in Lima, Peru. We identified the problem that children in suburban areas visit the dental office too late, uh, around the age of four, when unfortunately, these kind of clinical manifestations were detected. And of course, in a suburban area, we only have health posts or health centers that are uh, equipped uh, with basic uh, dental uh, uh, devices and basic de dental staff. We only have general dentists. And of course, many of them were they did not feel that capable of conducting complicated treatments uh, such as sedation or pulpotomies in their settings. So they have to be referred to a hospital. And that's part of the issue. The disease consequences require specialized care, but the Ministry of Health include oral care from the, day, from the second year of life. But this doesn't occur because the mother did not take the children to the health centers when their child are healthy, but when they are already deceased. So the proposed actions that we presented as a protocol was to use the opportunity of the uh, early childhood uh, visits when they have the visits for vaccination and well child controls by the nurses. And we have an extremely high compliance rate because there is a governmental program that asks or demands from the mother to take them to the health center in order to receive a free uh, meal or a free education later on in life. Those do, who do not receive the complete vaccines will not have a chance to attend to a primary school, for instance. So that's an, a magnificent incentive to the mothers to take their children to the vaccines or well child controls during the first four years of life. So we took this opportunity and proposed to uh, analyze any barrier that we'll have with the nurses to validate educational materials and conduct an epidemiological survey to know what was the carrier's burden of these particular populations. We also estimate the quality of life related to oral health in these uh, young children, of course, with surveys to the parents using the ECHOHIS tool and then we measure the efficacy of the interdisciplinary project that we proposed. This was part of the study design. We created a three arm group study where the first group was the intervention one where we trained nurses and dentists. The second group was only sharing material to the dentist so they could educate parents but without any training. And the third group was a control group to to measure the standard of care that we have in the Ministry of Health. So first of all, we have to analyze barriers. We don't want to impose anything to the nurses and we need to know if they were able to cooperate with us in this struggle. We find out with the validation of this questionnaire that nurses, we take a sample of nurses from the entire city of Lima in which 10 million inhabitants live but only the nurses that work in these well child clinics. And we know, or we discovered with this study, that they were not trained properly in the oral health uh, component. However, they, they recognize that oral health was extremely important, and many children that they see are uh, diseased with dental caries and they didn't know what to do or how to refer them to the dentist. So we have uh, quite a surprise with the conclusion that nurses consider oral health very important and they will uh, will to participate into an interdisciplinary project. So the second step was to validate instruments, educational instruments, and also a control card that I will share with you in a couple of minutes. And we conducted uh, an adaptation of some recommendation of the consensus of the Pediatric Dentistry Society here in Peru, translated into a focus group session to adapt those recommendations into easy to understand uh, uh, educational cards. There was a Delphi process using a website. And after two rounds, we decided to incorporate these 14 advices with a level of, of agreement above 90%. So 
as a result of this Delphi process, we were able to design these three cards, where three advisory cards for oral health or healthy lifestyles to prevent uh, early childhood caries that started from the pregnancy. We delivered these cards to the mothers in three moments in life. First, in the first visit, uh, before they uh, get, uh, they delivered, or during the first visit of the child to the well child clinic, that is as early as the one week of life to the to, for the first control. The second card was delivered in the appointment from six to 12 months. And the third card was delivered to, from 12 to 24 months uh, of age of the child. So they, these were tailored made advices for each uh, stage of life, trying to avoid the, uh, to saturate the mother with too many advices that maybe they will not remember. So we try to personalize these uh, cards for the mothers. So after this, we conducted the epidemiological study and together with it, a quality of life analysis, discovering that many of these children have the unfortunate situation we see in the lower right corner with a complete destruction of their primary teeth as a consequence of uh, dental caries. We use the CAST instrument to evaluate the early lesions, the cavitated lesions into dentine, and the consequences on soft tissues. And as early as the age of three, they have manifested some quality of life consequences, such as a restriction to talk, the family felt guilty about the disease, and unfortunately they were, they were not informed about how to protect their children because they did not receive any advice from uh, the health center when they took them for the vaccines or other medical appointments. So the advantage of instruments such as CAST or maybe the ICDAS that maybe is more popular will give us the advantage of detect the disease earlier to try to avoid the cavitated phase. So that's something that we take into account when we conducted the implementation phase that was the last a stage of the project aiming to reduce the burden of dental caries during the first four years of life. For this purpose, we train in the active intervention group the nurses to see the oral cavity of the children and uh, with some gauzes, dry the surfaces and identify risk factors together with early lesions in order to refer the children earlier to the dental office. Together with it, we design a three module session for the dentist because they are general dentists working in the health centers together with nurses. So they are not so used to work with very young children. So they have to be trained in prevention with fluorided agents, a traumatic restorative treatment with glass ionomers for sealants and restoration. And also the tool that was created for this purpose. That was a, a card that we will show you immediately after this slide. And we conducted all these trainings and sessions in the same facilities of the uh, health center. So they have not need to move away from their duties. This was a project that took us uh, three years and a half. Half of the year, we, we work in the validation of the process and we designed this card uh, that you see on your right side hand where we try to correlate the visits of the, uh, the, that, that were proposed by the vaccination card together with some advices of oral health. I mean, when the mother takes their children to the health center to receive a vaccine or a visit for nutrition, the nurse will know what kind of advice we'll provide and when will be suitable to refer this child to the dentist. And on the other hand, the dentist was trained as well to use the card and for preventive measures. We saw after four, the implementation of three years that the children that we followed during this implementation process have six times less cavitated dentine lesions in comparison with the passive intervention group where we only give materials and with the standard of care that was the control group where we see very similar results in red that are the cavitated dentine lesions. 
if we look at the global numbers, we see that the difference is not that big because the mass, the, there was a greater amount of uh, early lesions, but we presume that the vast majority of them were paralyzed. That means that even though they were early lesions, they did not progress into dentine uh, lesions this early in life. So we will delay the need of a intervention or a, a surgical procedure or a restorative care needs for these children. So that's why we consider that a strategy with all the limitations we found was considered successful. A secondary goal that we did not take into account uh, when we designed this project was that the number of visits to the dental office increased significantly during the implementation years. We started with this project in 2015 and we followed the children to 2018. And we see that in the second year of implementation, there was a threefold increase in the visits of children under the year, under the age of six to the dental office. And that was part of the site results of the project because the nurses and the health staff in this health center was trained in oral health uh, prevention. So they were, since uh, they were uh, motivated to refer the, the, the patients to the dentist. And that's how the incorporation of oral healthcare into existing mother and child healthcare program implemented by trained nurses and supported by healthcare uh, dentists reduced the burden of disease in three-year-olds. This is something that goes in line with the proposal of the minimal intervention dentistry that is healthy teeth or functional teeth for life. And that's the idea of this type of project. Around the globe, however, there are many research agendas in that line, incorporating non-dental professionals into the control of early childhood caries with many successful story. Many of them are, as well came from the uh, Middle East and North Africa with very successful uh, projects or initiatives incorporating, for instance, uh, polyol sugars or restricted sugars with uh, advices to the mothers in a comprehensive agenda showing that with this systematic review that the prenatal uh, interventions or what it's called the first 1000 years of care in the dental agenda will make the difference for the rest of the life of the individual it has been shown that the odds ratio of intervention even before the child is born will help to instill in the mother healthy habits and that's the key of the strategy to incorporate healthy habits from the day one. Because uh, for many years, we thought that dental caries was transmitted from mother to child, but what is actually transmitted from mother to child is the, uh, the behaviors. If a mother is a very sugary tooth mother, they will translate that uh, use, uh, that amount of sugar that they consume into the, their homes and that's why the children ended up uh, having these sugary diets. One of the challenges that we have identified for the dental professionals is that they are not used to work with very young children. So we have to train them in early detection to identify earlier the dental care process using tools such as the ICDAS, or the cast that we implemented in our project, and also the activity to try to identify not only the carious lesion, but to register the activity that could be identified uh, very easily with uh, proper training. The activity is referred on the state of the dental carious lesion, considering that we could have non-active, uh, non cavitated active lesions and inactive non non cavitated carious lesions and we could follow during many years with no activity uh, in place and that's part of the diagnosis training we see that this active lesion in the mammal have an aspect of white meat it looks like a chalk it is very close to the retention area of biofilm and when we use a dental prof with a round tip we see a superficial texture that will give us the idea of this pattern of microporosities in the surface of the enamel. This is an active lesion. However, if we change the behavior, if we instill 
the toothbrush in with a toothpaste that will create a remineralizing effect together with a polish effect of the silica particles incorporated in the toothbrush and that will polish the surface inactivating the lesion. Even though it looks white, it's a shiny white and it's away from the retention area due to passive eruption or maybe of a reduction of the uh, swallowed gum. And that's something that we could also confirm with our round tip probe. We, we use this probe to, to, uh, to identify the texture we will see or we will have the uh, impression of a smooth surface that was remineralized. And this is why uh, we have to understand how the caries process develops. We need to be trained in how to differentiate an early caries lesion from a uh, stain. Many uh, dentists, unfortunately, are still opening the images on the left because they think that this is caries and it has to be removed. But actually, it's a stain limited to enamel, or maybe it was an early lesion that was remineralized. And on the right side, the scenario, however, we have an initial active lesion that should be sealed, and there is no need to open those pits and fissures. In the cavitated lesions, we could also have active and inactive lesions. The active lesions in dentine are shown by the yellowish or brownish aspect. It's a very soft dentin and maybe accompanied by a white halo in the enamel margins. And if this cavity is enough open and could be cleaned, the minerals that come from the saliva and the toothpaste could remineralize together with the crystal deposits from the uh, uh, enamel uh, from the dentine uh, tubules and that will seal the dentine giving these shiny aspects sometimes acquire a brownish or a blackish uh, aspect but is very uh, shiny so to conclude the, with this uh, diagnostic part restoring without changing habits is like changing a window in a building on fire so we have to be more uh, prone to incorporate a medical view of dental diseases and that is wonderfully illustrated in this paper by Sebastian Paris and Hadrick Meyer Lukin from the University of, uh, of Charité in Germany where they identify the many factors that are involved in the caries process or at least the ones that we could modify as healthcare professionals restricting sugars, biofilm control, mineral balance are some of the pendant uh, tasks that we have to conduct. Not only the restorative care, the restorative care is part of the solution, but we have to go to the cause of the causes, that is sugary drinks and sugary snacks. Together with it, a proper disruption of biofilm will help to remineralize the a structure that could be suffering from demineralization always with the proper amount of fluoridate toothpaste and if we fail on the control of plague we could install a sealant treatment there are some uh, guidelines with, based on systematic reviews that claim that the combination strategy putting together sealants with fluoridated varnish will have a 3.3 fold effect on the protection of these uh, susceptible uh, surfaces even even if we have early enamel lesions we could seal those early lesions to avoid the biofilm deposits in the axis of sugars of these bacteria to arrest the progression of the disease so in that order of ideas we have preventive sealants and therapeutic sealants that is something that is also validated by the literature. There are many systematic reviews now that claim that the microcavitated lesions could be arrested if we seal them properly. Independent from the material that we use, if we seal those early lesions without the removal of any structure, we could paralyze the dental caries process. And if we have to deal with cavitated lesions, the idea is to present a very conservative approach was something that was suggested years ago by the group of Fustayama, 
the decomposed external denting confusedly termed infected it's not infected it's decomposed it's superficial it's soft has to be removed because it don't, doesn't have a remineralization potential. However, beneath it, we have a demineralized enzyme that is deep. It has some bacteria, but it doesn't matter because if we seal properly the restoration, the enzyme will remineralize. So the complete caddis removal that we used to use is no longer recommended today in cardiology. It's just reaffirming what Fusayama and his group described very wisely some decades ago about the demineralization zone that we have to remove in changing that conventional approach that G.B. Black presented years ago using restorative adhesive materials, only removing that that do not have the potential to remineralize. And together with that, we have the recommendation on caries tissue removal. When we have these kind of readings about the parallel of histological terms and the clinical manifestation or the clinical sensation we have, we have to identify these four dentines. The soft dentine, that is the one that is completely decomposed, that will deform very easily with the instrument. And I am using here some cornflakes to illustrate the principle, but it's quite uh, didactic, I think, that is easily removed with a scoop. Beneath it, we have a leathery dentin that demands a um, harder strength to remove it. It's still humid, but we could remove it with a little more uh, strength, uh, but it's still soft. And beneath it, we have the firm dentin that is more stable. It will take more force for, to be removed. This could be preserved into the cavity. We don't need to take it out. And finally, the hard dentin that will take more force to be removed. And this is something that will not need to reach at least at the bottom of the cavity. We could reach hard denting in the peripheral walls to guarantee the addition of the dental material. But if we are close to the pulp, it's not longer recommended to reach the uh, credentinar, as it used to be called. Do we use hand excavators or we combine it with other strategies? Well, there have been some studies that compare the chemical mechanical approaches with hand excavators only. And it has been shown that the, a well-trained uh, operator will be uh, equally effective removing the soft dentine with only uh, hand excavators or with chemical mechanical uh, elements. So the idea is to create that periphery of hard denting in order to seal the restoration in those cases. And the material could be composite resin, could be glass isomer, whatever you feel more comfortable with. The material will not make much of a difference in these class ones. And it's a matter of training the healthcare professionals in strategies such as the basic package of oral health, something that was proposed in 2002 by the Radboud University Collaboration Center of the WHO, providing a treatment of urgent needs together with affordable fluoridated toothpaste, toothpaste and of course the atraumatic restorative treatment, removing decomposed dentin and restoring with glass ionomer, also using glass ionomer sealants in pits and fissures that will be prone to dental caries. Nowadays, after this scenario of the pandemic and some years before, there was a rebirth of the silver diamond fluoride. It has been quite effective uh, many years ago in China and in Asian countries. And nowadays, it's a very, very active topic in different uh, scientific meetings and that's something that is quite important to incorporate as well because the studies have shown that the fluoride diamine uh, the fluoride diamine silver fluoride diamine is an effective agent against uh, dental caries progression especially in very young children that will be very difficult to treat under other circumstances such as absolute isolation or that will not stand 
uh, be seated on the dental chair for much time. So it's suggested to combine strategies. In those cases that the behavior of the child will be difficult to manage, we can use silver diamine fluoride. In others that will have more cooperation, we could do ART. And this is something that is key, a key element in public health strategies. It's not only a single strategy that will solve all the problems. It has been shown by this multi preventing intervention analysis that when we combine prevention, education, fluoride varnish, silver diamond fluoride, and ART, the sum of every strategy is stronger than the strategies uh, isolated. So we have to integrate strategies in the dental office as well. We have to change these sad reports on early childhood caries, the burden of disease, putting together an effort to join with other healthcare professionals, train our general dentist colleagues in order to perform these easier, simpler uh, treatments that will uh, prevent more difficult and more expensive uh, treatments for our uh, children. And I would like to close uh, this webinar by saying that dental caries is mainly a behavioral disease. We have to control sugars, uh, this organization of the biofilm, the disease could be prevented, could be stopped, or could be even reversed in early scenarios. That's how we understand dental caries as a dynamic process. No invasive treatments such as behavioral monitoring. Some uh, experts talk about a motivational interview as a very successful uh, strategy to reorientate diet and hygiene using sugar substitutes in some cases or using fluoridated agents in house in that should be based of course in an individual risk assessment for each patient sealing occlusal surfaces of risk or init initial lesions could arrest the progression of dental caries in the occlusal surfaces and when we have a cavitated lesion we should choose to do a selective removal that will prevent an accidental pulp of exposure or a need of more complicated treatments that will prolong what we call the spiral of death of dental treatments only working together with other healthcare professionals we will be able to reduce the extremely high burden of early childhood caries and will reduce in the coming years only if we got, get closer to nurses, nutritionists, pediatricians, general, general physicians, and midwives, social workers, you call it. We have many allies prone to help in this struggle and we are only stronger if we work together. Thank you so much for your attention and I am very honored to share this conference with you. I hope you, you like it as much as I enjoyed preparing it for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pesarisi, for this uh, informative lecture. Uh, I'm really impressed by uh, the results uh, you had from your study. Uh, I got many thank you messages and positive feedback regarding your presentation. And all, I also I got a great insight from uh, audience from Bangladesh, Peru, and India as well. Uh, we reached up to 514 uh, audience for your presentation. Uh, so, so amazing. Uh, now let's go to the question, please, if you don't mind. I have one question regarding uh, the children uh, who live in poor urban area uh, who complain uh, from uh, bad oral hygiene and uh, financial problems uh, cannot prevent uh, providing treatments for them. What do you advise to provide for these children? Yes, it's, it's kind of the scenario we have to deal with here in Peru as well. We have many underserved communities, unfortunately, and they are quite poor as well. So we try to, to promote these kind of strategies with the early advisory panels, try to incorporate the mother in the educational session, try to reduce sugars. That is like the first domino piece that will then uh, degenerate into the dental care problem. But once the process is installed, we should choose to incorporate very 
cheap and easy to implement strategies such as silver diamine fluoride to at least arrest the progression of the lesion and try to rescue this family to take part of their own oral health. It's impossible for us to solve it by our own. It's trying to work together with them, educating them and how important this oral health because I think that is the same in, in Saudi Arabia where some mothers say, well, they are primary teeth, they will fall yeah. off, it doesn't matter. So that's the main issue. They, we have many knowledge barriers and we don't understand that the quality of the dentition in the early years will be determinants of the posterior or the future dentition. So that's something that we should educate, is education and education and education. Yes, perhaps I think we have to focus on uh, to what extent do you think social economic status can affect carers' risk? Social what? Excuse me. Social economic status. Ah, it's extremely important. I, we also take that into account, and it's actually many factors involved. The social economical status are related to education, are related to access to health, are related to the sharing a toothbrush it's amazing but we found families that there were six individuals that share one single toothbrush for the whole family and that's of course is a very shocking reality but it's something that happens so we have to try to take into account those elements those elements and those socially uh, dispar the social disparities should take into account to put them into the priority because they will need us the most okay. Uh, do you think that using vitamin D supplements in the early years of life can affect carers' risk? I honestly don't know that. I have not any information regarding the topic. I am sorry I could not answer that question. Uh, I think it's reduced about 54%. Uh, uh, it can reduce carers if it's taken in the first uh, four years of life. But also I need, we have to double check that. Is the, uh, is the nano silver fluoride effective as silver dynamine fluoride? I have no experience with the first one. Uh, we recently used the silver diamond because it was not commercially available in Peru. So in our project in particular, we have to use whatever the Ministry of Health had in their supplies. So we have fluoridated varnish, we have glass ionomer, and we have education. So that's the only three education. elements that we were able to, to incorporate together with uh, giving toothbrushes as part of the program, but nothing else because we did not have those materials in the public health arena. Okay, another question. In case of art, do you advise to place glass ionomer? For how long do you expect that glass ionomer will stay in the cavity? That's a wonderful question and it's quite repetitive in the seminars that we have uh, in this side of the world as well. Many people think that glass enamel is a provisional material and when managed properly, it's as durable as a composite or as durable as an amalgam, but it requires three very good training in managing the, how to prepare the cavity, how to clean it, the conditioning previous to the glass enamel, how we mix the glass and amer will make the entire difference between a very poorly uh, survival rate uh, and compare it with a long-term restoration. So that's, I think, fundamental. In our study, we were able to see that the glass and amer sealants remain for two years, uh, very, early, uh, very early findings, but uh, they were very early childs as well. But the advantage of glass ionomer is that it's easier to use when we have a young child because we don't need anesthetic, we don't need uh, the dental burr, we don't need uh, isolation, so it's, it's uh, more friendly for the patient. But the dentists have to be trained to manage it properly. I have a lovely question. Do you expect uh, turbines traditional method like hand piece? will gone and disappear in next days? I think that uh, this pandemic put us in a very tipping point in our profession. Uh, and I think that this is something that will make us think on other strategies. Uh, if we just put a couple of examples of disruptive, uh, disruptive events, if we think of the bigger company of taxis, they don't have one single car. If we think in the biggest company of music, iTunes doesn't have a single CD. So why 
a dental office should have a dental handpiece and a dental chair. We could have a table, we could have a little cushion, put the okay. child in a position, put silver diamond fluoride, use ART with hand excavators. Why not? So, um, okay, another question. Can we partially remove caries and restore with glass animal rather than complete removal? Yes, and it's fantastic. I like personally step -wise use it. Sometimes uh, the stepwise technique is uh, suggested. However, I will not go that way because of a single reason. When okay. some studies in Brazil were conducted with the stepwise, the patients did not come back because they okay. feel comfortable and you don't, uh, you, they don't have the way to control what happened next. So a selective caries removal with soft dentine, if we are very close to the put chamber, will be enough with a good sealed restoration that will be enough in one single visit. And I think this will be more cost effective. Also together with the risk of when doing the second intervention, we could have a, an accident of exposing the tooth with the, intent, uh, the, the pulp chamber with that intention of reaching hard denting. Another interesting uh, question. Can we expect a promising future for minimum invasion treatments for caries lesion? That's a great question. And actually, it was a matter of the last uh, ORCA meeting. The European Association of, of Cardiology have been uh, debating also the IADR, the International Association for Dental Research, has been debating a lot of how minimal intervention dentistry could find a place now in the post-pandemic world. Uh, the audience are asking your email, doctor, if uh, somebody are interested uh, for, future, uh, for contacting you to future updates. Sure. Of or course. your uh, an Instagram account, if you don't mind. Yes, I have my Instagram account. I found an Instagram. It's the only social network I have, unfortunately. It's Dr. Heraldo Pesaresi uh, in Instagram. And I will share my email, of course, if you need any paper or if we need to share the, the results from our study, I will be more than happy to share it with you. So I will leave it here in the, in the chat. Okay, yeah, in the chat. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. It's in, the email is in the chat now. Uh, for uh, personally, I think we have to focus on the research and uh, developing a national care preventive program based on conducting many surveys, uh, like as you say, the regulatory right publication and check up for high care uh, risk patients. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Besarisi, for your time giving this uh, amazing presentation, and thank you uh, for. Uh, accepting our invitation from the SSPD. Personally, I'm looking forward to have you again in the future webinars, talking about the, your philosophy in the minimum intervention dentistry. Thank you so much, uh, Moshes, gracias. Uh, I will give the mic now to Dr. Hadoun to present the second lecture. Thank you Dr. so Dr. much, Hadoun. it was my pleasure. It was a real honor to share this with you. Dr. Hadoun, the mic is yours. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Alinda, for, the, for hosting this webinar for tonight. And I would like to thank also Dr. Besserassi for the very nice, informative presentation. And I will thank also the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry for inviting me tonight for this webinar and to give me the honor to, to introduce Dr. Noor Al Habib. Dr. Noor Habib is currently practicing as a clinical psychologist at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Jeddah. She got doctorate in clinical psychology from University College London and master's in mental health studies from King's College London and her bachelor's degree in psychology from King Abdulaziz University. She works integratively using different psychological approaches including connective uh, behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, compassion focused therapy, and mindfulness. Today, she is going to talk about the self compassion for healthcare professionals. So, in, uh, please join me to welcome Dr. Noor Habib. Dr. Noor, the mic is yours, and we are all ears. 
Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm so pleased to um, be here today. Uh, it's just a reflection of um, how much the level of awareness is increasing in our society. Um, and I'm so pleased um, to join you tonight. So um, as you mentioned, uh, today we'll talk about self-compassion for health care professionals. And um, while previous lecture was very much to entertain the mind, uh, today um, I would like to entertain the heart and the soul and think about ourselves as human before being professionals. Um, that's more of a holistic approach in our practice. Um, I always like to start by inviting people to slow down, to check with themselves. So if you're willing, I would just ask you briefly to check with yourself and see, perhaps asking yourself, how are you feeling today? How are you? What is going through your mind? I know this is not quite interactive, but I do get a wide range of answers usually. Some people say stressed, some people say um, excited for the lecture, some people say worried, anxious, burnout. So it depends really on what is going through, uh, going in their life and what is going through their mind. A very quick reality check. I'm very aware of you know current circumstances, the pandemic, and um, you know we're we're going through quite an unusual time, quite unusual experiences. So whatever emotions come up for you, I would say that's quite a normal human experience. It's very normal to feel anxious, worried, angry frustrated, disappointed, or even happy or content. Those are normal human uh, emotions, normal internal experiences. Regardless of the pandemic, we're, we're, we're living in quite a difficult time, you know, high expectations from souls and others, very high demand of responsibilities, increasing level of stress. So we are functioning in an autopilot mood, meaning we wake up in the morning, we start our daily routine, and we find ourselves all of a sudden in front of you know, our clinic, starting our work. We are very much operating in an autopilot mood. So it might be worth, as, as I'm inviting you to slow down, to perhaps thinking a little bit more about compassion. I would like to start with a very small pool. So, Ms. Noor, would you mind launching the poll? So it's, it's a very short survey. And I would like you to, if you're willing, to choose. So what is compassion? So when you hear the word compassion, what goes through your mind? Which one of those choices? If you can choose and then submit your answer for us, please. more seconds. Okay. Shall we see the results? Okay, good, excellent. Kindness, uh-huh, 25%. Sensitivity to suffering, excellent, that's 20%. Um, 4% weakness, okay, that's a common one. Warmth, well done. Self-pity, 1%, not surprise. Self-esteem, 19%. Okay, good. Okay, so close. Shall we launch the other one? So, Ms. Noor, can we launch the other one? Yes, excellent, thank you. So what is your main fear of compassion? So, you know, for those who had some kind of negative association, I would say, um, what would be your main fear of compassion? Getting on with life is about being tough, 
if I become less critical, my standards will drop, I will become a weak person, my flaws will show, others will reject me, bad things will happen to me. Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, let's see the results. Okay, I become a weak person. That's a, a twenty-seven percent. Not surprised. Uh, Twenty-six percent getting on with life is about being tough. Mm -hmm. And then twenty-one percent. If I become less critical, my standards will drop. It's it's uh, those are very interesting result okay and then 10 percent my flaws will show nine percent others will reject me seven percent but things will happen to me thank you very much uh, miss Noor, for sharing um a, a very interesting answer thank you for participating it is very interesting how we make sense of the word compassion and how we then apply compassion in our life how we make sense of those narratives and how we make sense of those concepts in our life is very much related to wider social contexts and our own personal experiences and our filters and how we make sense of those experiences in life what thoughts and feelings come up for us when we hear these words so that's what is compassion. What is not compassion? So usually when I talk about compassion, I say, what is not compassion? Self-esteem is actually not compassion. Why? Because self-esteem is very much related to evaluation of yourself. It's about evaluating your own worth. So that's not compassion. Okay. Self-indulgence. Okay. So sometimes when I have patients who are going through quite severe depression, I usually talk about self-care. Self-care and self-compassion are always part of my, my therapeutic sessions. And I find it sometimes very interesting that, you know, when I, I talk with a patient about uh, self-compassion, following session, they come and they say, well, doctor, you know, I've got something very expensive for myself. This is my new sunglasses or this is that. And I say, oh my God, no, this is self-indulgent. This is not self-compassion. Self it's not about spending your money and spoiling yourself. It's rather about pampering yourself and directing that kind of warmth and kindness to yourself and to others. Also, it's not self-pity. Okay, there was, I remember, 1% self-pity. So self-pity is about feeling that you're suffering and you're a victim of circumstances. It's about feeling bad for yourself. Okay, so that's self-pity. And, and for people who perhaps have found some kind of um, negative association to compassion, uh, when they thought it would be a form of weakness or vulnerability, that probably that was more related to self-pity. So again, not self-esteem, not self-indulgent, and not self-pity. So then what is compassion, okay? So compassion basically is about that kind of sensitivity to the suffering of self and others. So it's about recognizing when we feel whatever emotion we are feeling. So if you're stressed, then you're able to stop, slow down and notice what emotion that you are feeling, what thoughts are going through your mind. So you're able to connect you're sensitive enough to notice and connect with whatever emotion that you're having, okay? We're not connecting so we feel pity for ourselves, but we are connecting and that require a level of courage to be able to connect with the pain or the suffering or the stress or whatever emotion you're having. But then why are we doing that? Because there is an intention behind it. It's about that commitment to try and to relieve whatever you're going through. I am part of currently, I'm part of the program that we have in King Faisal Hospital uh, for our staff to support uh, our staff during COVID. And I keep saying this, you know, we are going through quite difficult time. I would still give the same lecture, you know, in daily life because I do know, even if the pandemic was not around, because I know how stressful our, you know, life can be. 
and being health professionals, how much stress we go through. And sometimes we feel very burnt out, you know, even if we're looking after ourselves, we try, but you know, we all, we're human. I think this is a, a very important message. We are human. And even if we are professional, it's about connecting with ourselves and being more mindful and more aware of whatever is going through our life not to feel bad about ourselves, but to take care of ourselves. And that's the commitment to try to relieve our whatever stress we're going through. Why are we talking about compassion again? Because we have tricky brains. And it's, it's, you know, it's funny to say that, but if we think about it in a very, very kind of basic way, our brain um, consists of what we would call old brain, and the new brain, okay? So the old brain is very much um, linked to um, our motives, emotions, and behaviors. Things are common between us and an animal in general. So they are very basics, okay? The new brain is much more sophisticated. It does involve imagination, okay? thinking, oh my God, in the future, what might, might happen tomorrow? What might happen in that meeting or with that patient or in that event? Planning, okay, so we have that kind of much more sophisticated brain. We can plan the executive functions, right? Worrying, so if we're anticipating what might happen in the future, then that's more about worrying. Ruminating, so about what happened in the past and, you know, replaying that. Fear of the mind, thinking, well, what might be going on for the other person, for other people, that kind of thing. Okay, so we do have tricky brain, human being. Okay, so it's not that kind of very basic motives, emotion, behaviors, but rather the complexity of our brain, of our brain makes our life harder. And that's where we need compassion. So for example, okay, new brain, sometimes it's actually unhelpful. So if we think about this little zebra there, okay, which has a, an old brain, okay? So if they are exposed to a level of threat and their level of anxiety goes up, let's say a zebra is eating the grass, walking around, and then all of a sudden they notice there is a tiger there. The normal reaction would be the level of anxiety would go very high, right? And then the moment they escape, the level of anxiety will start to go down, down, and then guess what? They will go back to eating grass. Think about us human beings. So if we are exposed to any level of, of danger, whether that's actual, like coronavirus, for example, or if it is perceived because of our previous experiences, think about yourself as, you know, dentist working with children. I'm, I'm an adult clinical psychologist, but, you know, the applications of, of what we're talking about, or even about yourself, you know, we're talking about ourselves as human. When we are exposed to any threats, whether it's real or perceived, the level of anxiety goes up. The problem is because of the complexity and the sophistication of our brains, our level of anxiety might not go down. And that's the complexity of the new brain. So rumination, we will start to think about it again. Oh my God, what has just happened? Oh, last week and a year later, we'll still be telling the same story. So that's ruminating, going over it, oh, oh, go, go, to go over it over and over and over again. And then imagining worst outcome. Okay, oh my God, I could have, this could have happened or that could have happened. So the level of anxiety or the level of stress is maintained and self-criticism, right? Some people said, well, if I don't criticize myself, my standards will drop, right? So self-criticism, oh, I should have been more careful. I should have done this. I should have done that. So that's the complexity of our brain. Why are we talking about that? Because we, we're trying to say that we actually really need compassion. Life is hard enough, and our brain, our turkey brains, can really make life harder sometimes. So I, I found some really lovely cartoons, and I just thought it would be lovely to share them, right? Uh, so animals don't get caught up with essential concerns, for example. Animals do not worry about their self-image, right? So they wouldn't think about how other people perceive them or see them. So they don't have new brain areas to question or judge or criticize their own natural responses or experiences. So our brain is actually tricky. The, the new brain, what we would call the, the new brain. So bringing compassion, what might help? Okay, so this is the old brain, the new brain, okay? So what we are hoping to bring in more is what we would call mindfulness, okay? 
mindfulness is basically a type of meditation when individuals take in moment to moment experience, okay, as they come. So it's about noticing. There are two main principles in mindfulness. The first one is it's about developing that state of awareness of the present moment. It's about connecting with here and now. Okay, so it's about noticing, grounding yourself in the present moment, okay, and then not judging yourself for any thoughts or feeling that might come up for you, okay? So if there is a high level of stress, if you notice, because we said it's about connecting with your internal experiences and emotions. So if you connect, then you're more able to, that, to have that kind of level of awareness of what is going through your mind, what thoughts and what emotions you're feeling. Okay, so you're connecting with the mind, with the heart and with the body. So, and what symptoms you're experiencing in your body. Okay, and then you're not judging yourself for having whatever thoughts or feeling that you're having. I do sometimes have some patients who would come and say, and, and say well, doctor, I feel very angry for feeling upset. Okay, so they come with anger. But actually, when you dig in, you find a lot of sadness, you know, bereavement cases, um, PTSD, you know, trauma cases, you know, as, as you know, in, in, you know, just, you know, think about the current circumstances. Um, so, so some people find it really hard to connect with emotions, which we said require courage. So they would try to push that away. I really like a metaphor that I always mention to my patients and my colleagues, okay? I want you to imagine that you are in a swimming pool. And while you are in that swimming pool, you have, you're holding in your hand a beach ball, those colorful plastic beach ball. And if you're holding that beach ball and you try to press it against the water, what would happen? It will pop up. And if you keep doing that the whole afternoon, what would happen? that would happen exactly the same. So our emotions are very similar. The more we try to push them away, the more they come up and they come up in different ways. If you feel you find yourself a little bit more irritable, you cannot handle your emotions. If you feel angry or frustrated for no reason, perhaps that's a good moment to stop, connect and ask yourself what is going through my mind how am I feeling? And try to bring yourself back to the present moment. It's not about yesterday and that's ruminating. It's not about the future and that's worry, but it's rather about the present moment, okay? If you notice with the, with the little ones you're working with, that sometimes you have more capacity to deal with their emotional, you know, whatever is going on for them or other days you're less able, maybe you need to stop connect and reflect with yourself what is going on for me and what is going on in, you know as an internal experience that's where compassion comes okay so mindfulness in practice you know mindfulness is, is a lecture in itself right so um it's a skill it's a skill that requires training, time, and effort. I really encourage you to take a, to to read about mindfulness. There are a lot of really good resources out there um, that I really very much encourage you to go and read about it because it does it does improve the quality of life and it does help us to develop that different relationship to our thoughts and feelings. So if we go back to that kind of uh, previous, um, yeah. So this one. So the old brain and, and the complexity of the old brain and new brain, mindful brain, okay, that state of observation that we develop and awareness would help us not to engage with all of these kind of getting lost with the rumination and mentalization and planning, but it's rather help us to be more aware of whatever is going through our minds. So this little dog is, is being very mindful. Okay, so... Um, I don't know if there are, there are any questions. I'm not quite uh, used to quite an interactive mode, but yeah. So um, those are, so types of emotion regulation systems or what I would call the three cycles model, okay? I don't know if you have uh, uh, pencils or pens and papers next to you, that would be really great because later on we might, I might ask you to do an exercise, okay? So our emotional regulation system consists of three systems actually, okay? So the first one is the threat focused, okay? So the threat focus is about protection and safety seeking and that's the red, okay? 
So, and that is linked to the feeling of anxiety, anger, and disgust. Okay, so if you feel anxious or angry, probably then your threat system is activated. Okay, if you feel, and that's very much the survival mode. If you're so busy at work, wanting to meet deadlines, and you're, you feel so anxious or so worried, probably you are functioning based on threat mode. Perhaps in the current pandemic, most people are functioning, are driven by threat mode. Okay, and then the blue one is the drive, excite mode. Okay, and that's very much about wanting, pursuing, achieving, and consuming. Okay, and um, being, you know, active and, and wanting to pursue a goal. Okay, most health professionals say when I ask people to, to point on that or to reflect on those systems, most people say that we actually function based on threat and drive modes. So we are either running based on threat or drive, whether we have a deadline to meet or I'm very worried that I will not meet this deadline. Okay. The fourth one and the green one is very much compassion. Okay. It's about safety seeking. It's about kindness, calmness, warmth. Okay. There is an exercise I usually ask people to do before the exercise. So something like this image would very much activate the threat mode. Something like this would perhaps activate the drive mode, right? It's about wanting, achieving. It's the drive mode. Something like this, quite soft and lovely, would be very much the soothing system is activated. I usually ask people, and I don't know if you're willing, I'll just give you a minute to reflect in your own circles. So if I ask you to draw your own circles, the threat, the drive, and the soothe, which one would be bigger and which one it would be smaller? So we take a moment to reflect on those, on those which one would be bigger and which one would be smaller? Which one is the dominant system? So people with high level of anxiety usually would say the red is actually really big and then the drive would be kind of medium and then the green would be really small. People with depression and low mood usually would have a very small drive and that's where we usually, when we have people with depression, we usually really encourage them to do more exercise and to activate the drive system, to be more uh, physically active, okay? What we hope for is a balance between those circles, okay? We don't want people to just be kind of kind and, you know, very airy kind of thing. We don't want people to be driven the whole time because that's so exhausting. And we do not want you to be feel, to feel threatened the whole time because then you cannot, you cannot achieve things and you cannot soothe yourself. But it's rather to keep a level of balance. And I always like to say that our balance is different in, at different times of our lives. What is balanced today is different from tomorrow, from uh, not necessarily within days, but depending on your responsibilities and what is going on in your life. Okay, so this is an example of um, how, you know, somebody can draw their circles. Okay, threat system is, is very big. That's the drive. Perhaps this is somebody with an anxiety disorder and then the soothing would be really small. So we aim for a balance. Okay, so one thing we teach people, linking back to mindfulness, one thing we teach people is that uh, breathing exercises can help regulating the threat mode or the threat system. When you try to slow down and focus more on your breathing, that's when the actually compassionate soothing system is flourish. Okay, it starts to get bigger and the threat system gets smaller. When the threat system gets smaller and the um, compassion soothing system is nourished, that's when the drive is better. And that's how we reach a better balance between them. Okay, if you're willing, I would ask you if we can do a 
breathing exercise together. Okay? I usually ask people if they're willing, and I would assume that if people are here, then they are willing to do the exercise. So soothing breathing rhythm exercise. I would very much encourage everyone, if you're willing, to sit comfortably in your chair, because we want to do this together. Please, I cannot see you, but I am very sure that you will try. Okay, so I would very much encourage you to sit comfortably on your chair, whether you are on a sofa or a chair. Making sure that you place both feet flat on the floor. Noticing the connection between your body and the chair. And perhaps if you're willing, dropping your shoulders. Making sure that your back is comfortable. And if you're willing, I would ask you to close your eyes. And if you're willing, I will gently invite you to bring your attention to your breathing. As you're breathing in and breathing out. Allowing the air to come down into your lung. And noticing the breathing as it goes through your nose. Just notice your breathing and play and experiment with your breathing. Perhaps breathe a little faster or a little slower until you find a breathing pattern that for you. That seems to be your own soothing, comforting rhythm. It is like you are checking in, linking up with the rhythm within your body that is soothing and calming to you. What you will usually find is that your breathing is slightly slower and deeper than normal. The in-breath is about three seconds. So take it in, hold, and then let it out in three. And again, allowing the breath to go through your nose in three, hold, and then allow it to go out in three. Ensure that the breaths in and out are smooth and even. Now we can spend a little while for as long as you wish, just focusing on our breathing. If you notice that your mind is wandering or you're getting distracted, that is very normal. I would gently invite you to bring your attention back to your breathing as you're breathing in and you're breathing out. Now we can just ground ourselves for a moment. So turn your attention to your body as a, whole, as a whole. Sensing the weight of your body resting on the chair and the floor underneath you. Allowing yourself to feel held and supported. Coming to rest in the present moment. 
And again, remember that it is perfectly okay for your mind to wander. Simply notice where it goes with curiosity and gently guide it back to the present moment to here and now. And if you find focusing on your breathing is difficult, perhaps focus on an object in front of you. As you're breathing in and breathing, breathing out, bringing your attention to that feeling of calmness, And when you feel ready, I would slowly ask you to open your eyes, bringing yourself back to the room, to the present moment. Okay. I usually ask for feedback again here and see how people um, have found the exercise. And they usually get very different um, feedback on the exercise. Some people find it very relaxing and they say, well, I felt like sleeping and that was very relaxing. Some people find it really hard to focus on their breathing. Um, so it's, it's quite, you know, an individual experience how people might feel. Um, and um, yeah. Okay, so unique qualities of compassion itself. Caring commitment is, is one of the first quality, unique qualities of compassion itself. And that is very much linked to what we mentioned earlier. It's about that feeling of warmth, understanding, kindness, wanting to help. Okay. Wisdom. Okay. So wisdom, um, being compassionate doesn't mean that you are selfless and you'll be out there doing everything for everyone, but it's rather being wise with when to provide support and how to provide support, okay? You're wise enough to know what kind of emotions um, or what kind of help you offer, whether to yourself or others in specific, specific situation, situations. Strength is about, actually, I always say, for you to go in and to see a very sick patient, that requires a lot of strength. So compassion is actually not a form of weakness, but actually it is linked to a lot of strength. Flow of compassion. Okay, so self to others. And that's very much what we health professionals do, direct compassion to others. And we're very good in this from us to others. Okay, others to self. So receiving compassion from others, and that's kind of, you know, usually it is quite low when we measure it in, in health professionals, being able and open to receive compassion from other people, okay? And then self to self, and that is about self-compassion, providing that support to yourself or developing that part of you that would be there for you when you need it, okay? Self-compassion. So let's reflect on what you are really doing and what else you need to develop. So instead of me telling you, uh, giving you some tips on self-compassion, self let's reflect on things you are already doing and think about things you perhaps want to develop a little bit more of. So physically, which is about softening the body, okay? If you reflect with yourself, I don't know if you have a pen and paper or if you just think with yourself. How do you care for yourself physically? Are you good with exercise? Perhaps spa or massage or that kind of thing? Warm bath or warm shower? Perhaps a cup of tea? Or your lovely cup of coffee? Hmm? Can you think of new ways to release the tension and stress that builds up in your body? Do you, do you have that incorporated in your daily routine? That's me time and I need to look after this body because sometimes people come and say, I feel so much pain in my shoulders and my neck or, and that's very much stress and tension. Are you taking the time to look after you and your body? Okay. 
mentally, which is about reducing agitation and stress. So the question here is, how do you care for your mind? Especially when you're under stress. The present time, perhaps, or when, when you have a lot of patients back to back, a lot of meetings, and you're running around and, you know, with life responsibility and, you know, all that kind of work-life balance. Do you give some time for meditation and slowing down and noticing your breathing? Or perhaps just, you know, being less serious and watching a funny movie and enjoying a good laugh? Reading an inspiring book, something for your soul, something that would, you know, you know, for your own self-growth? Okay. Is there a new strategy you would like to try to let your thoughts come and go more easily? Emotionally, in terms of soothing and comforting yourself, how do you care for yourself emotionally? Anything that gives you that kind of sense of connection emotionally and I don't know if you have a pet or you write things down or you have a specific habit that would help you just to connect emotionally. Is there anything else you would like to try to soothe and comfort yourself? Relational and in terms of connecting with others, but not for others, but rather for yourself. It's, it's about connection for your own emotional, you know, it's, you do it for yourself. How or when do you relate to others that bring you genuine happiness? Meeting with the friends, sending a card, perhaps playing a game, something that is relational, but it would feed your soul and your heart. Is there any way that you would like to enrich these connections? Hmm. Okay. So if you were in front of me, I would be asking you these questions, but I'm very much encourage you to reflect with yourself and just taking the time for yourself, really. Spiritual. Commit to your own values. So what, what do you do to take, to take care of yourself spiritually? Pray, help others, any other thing that would help you to feel more enriched spiritual if you've been neglecting your spiritual side is there anything else you would like to do more of in your life i really love this poster and if you are at king face you perhaps have seen this if you're not then um you know in previous teams i always had this with me and I really love it because it gives you, it reminds us that self-compassion doesn't have to be something really big. It can be the smallest thing. I always like to talk about my cup of coffee, okay? Every morning when I wake up in the morning, I must, must drink a cup of coffee. So I can drink this cup of coffee thinking, well, I didn't sleep well last night. I need to concentrate. I have this or that. Or what I learned to do is, to take that five or 10 minutes for myself, to slow down, smelling the coffee, feeling the warmth, tasting the coffee, five or 10 minutes for myself, for my heart, for my soul, to be compassionate to myself and to take care of myself, to be more able to be emotionally available to my patients and people around me. These are some mindfulness apps. Uh, that can be really helpful to download and they have a lot of really good exercises. I personally use them. I always uh, tell my patients and my colleagues about them. Um, they're really good, really helpful in terms of bringing that kind of soothing, breathing exercises to your daily routine. These are some references and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for taking the time, I would say, to be kind to yourself and compassionate for your heart and your soul. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctora, for the very nice presentation. I really felt calm and relaxed just listening to you. <laughs> and I have a lot of questions, if you allow me to start yes. with. 
Okay, the first question, one of the audience was asking that he's reading a book called Letting Go by David <laughs> Hawkins. And it was a great book. He talks about uh, becoming mindful and surrender. He's not sure if you read it or not, mm. but he wants to ask you, would us surrendering or being compassionate make us weak? That's mm. how we feel. Mm. That's a really good question. And I think, thank you very much for, for referring to the book. I actually did not read the book, but um, it's a very common uh, point people bring that, and I think if you, you remember the poll, some people did choose that being compassionate, meaning being weak, mm -hmm. right? And one of the fears that people are scared that if they are uh, compassionate, then they might be weak. Actually, um, uh, as I mentioned before, and there is growing body of evidence on compassion, and there is, uh, you know, a, a therapy called compassion focused therapy. There are good evidence and growing body of evidence supporting that actually compassion focused therapy, which is about being compassionate to yourself and others and being open to receiving that compassion from other people does help your emotional wellness and your psychological well-being. Mm -hmm. So being compassionate doesn't mean you are weak, but it's rather it comes from a place of strength to be able to look after yourself and others. We only strong people who are, who are able to look after themselves and others. If you're weak, then you're probably, are, you are very lost in self-pity rather than self-compassion. So for you to pour from your cup, you need your cup to be full. So that's a place of strength. That's good. Thank you. Another question also. Um, which is the stronger, compassion or empathy? Hmm, that's an interesting one. So they're quite different, right? So pity is very much about feeling sorry for yourself. Compassion is rather about noticing and being aware of what emotions you are feeling. Mm -hmm. Not only noticing, but with the commitment to relieve that suffering. So you're not only aware of how you're feeling and you're connecting with that emotion, but also you're doing something to relieve that suffering for yourself or for others. So they are quite different. So it's not about crying for your own problems, but it's about noticing. It's okay to cry, but it's not about getting lost in crying. It's about noticing, connecting, and that might be actually very painful. But once you feel it, then you give it some time to process it and you think then, okay, and then what can I do to relieve this? Great, thank you. Another question. Can we have the three types at the same time? Which types? Uh, you mean the uh, threat, drive, and... Uh, yes, so we do move between those circles. At some point in our lives, what we hope to reach is a level of balance. And again, the word balance is different at different stages of our lives. It depends on what's going on, where we are at, our relationships, our life, the social context, all these different kind of circumstances. But um, we move between those circles, really. Okay? So, so some people are driven by threat, and some people are actually uh, the, they're between drive and compassion more, and some people are between threat and compassion but what we hope for is there is a level of threat, but it's not big to the level that it would make us very anxious the whole time. But it would make, would make me ready for the lecture. But it wouldn't stop me from giving the lecture. So that's the drive. And then the soothing, before, definitely before I start any lecture, I do my breathing exercise to feel that I'm emotionally available and ready. So kind of looking after yourself, being aware, noticing, and you know, all, the, the whole, the, all of the three circles are interacting, really. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. OK, another question. Um, one of the audience saying very interesting topic. What you. are your general recommendations for dealing with self suicidal? Suicidal. Self, um, is that suicidal? Suicidal, suicidal, maybe, yeah. Thoughts Sus due to overwhelming, despair, and how to break free. 
from the malignant cycle. I'm so sorry that you're feeling in this way. Um, you know, suicidality is, is a very painful feeling okay very painful thoughts and feelings when somebody feel that they cannot live anymore or they want to give uh, up in life um, it is something that we see in clinics it's something that comes with depression with, with different issues mental health issues I would very much encourage you not to suffer alone we are people who are trained to deal with such things my my you know psychiatry colleagues myself clinical psychologists we can help with, we can help with medication, we can help with learning skills, we can help to support you. Please never struggle alone, never suffer alone. If those thoughts are very active and very, you know, kind of very immediate, please go to ER and, and make sure that you look after yourself, okay? Yeah. And if it's something that you can wait for, then make sure you go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. It please might be kind of any other kind of uh, psychological problem maybe. It can be usually suicidality is linked to uh, different psychological issues. So what we very much need to do is a full assessment, comprehensive assessment to understand what might be going on for them. I would very much say, please don't suffer alone. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Another question. The exercises you tell us about and the experience, how can we practice such a thing with the children? That's lovely, lovely question. Yeah. There are apps, actually, mindfulness app for children. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look them up in, in uh, your, your phone, your smartphone, you will find some mindfulness um, apps for children, which I very much encourage to incorporate in, in daily activities. I'm aware that I was trained in the UK and I'm aware that some, some schools do offer that in, in schools. Right, so children uh, are brought up learning those uh, those skills, and they can apply them. That's part of you know um, the general skills that people can learn to um, promote their their emotional wellness. Mm -hmm. Okay, another one regarding the same topic, maybe if there is any methods to re to relax the children facing the fear in the dental office. Excellent there question. Any exercises, any apps, anything? Can we help us? I'm not aware of, I'm, I'm not a child psychologist, okay? <laughs> but I am aware that, you know, there are a lot of breathing exercises that you can uh, very much um, uh, teach your, uh, the little ones to use, okay? Just, you know, simple breathing, but the techniques, I think you can find things online. If you have a, a child psychologist around in your clinic or in your hospital, perhaps they can help. Okay, so the difference, I think the concepts are, are the same, but the exercise would be different. So something like, I remember when I worked, you know, a rotation, pediatric, um, a pediatric rotation. So we would say something like, let's, let's fill in the balloon in your tummy. So when you, uh, you take the, the deep breath, then you're filling in the balloon. And okay, so notice the balloon getting bigger. And then, so that kind of playful, nice, creative way of, of doing the exercise with the same principles, but the applications would be different. Okay, thank you. Other question for Dr. Noor is, how can we stop thinking about existence when it starts to distract us from doing anything? Mm. I would need more, um, uh, you know, more questions, more information about what, uh, what they mean by existence. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Can you read the question again? Yeah, sure. How can we stop thinking about existence when it starts to distract us from doing anything? Okay. So I would say in general, I would need more information, but I would say what we're hoping for is not to stop people from thinking, mm -hmm. but it's rather to develop that relationship, different relationship with our thoughts and feelings that we notice and we become more aware of those thoughts and feelings. So we're not pushing them away like the beach ball, but rather we're aware of them and we're more able by different skills, we're more able to deal with those thoughts, not necessarily problem solving, but sometimes how we relate to those thoughts, it's very much like a train that we observe them, you know, just passing by. Okay, good. Mm. That's good. <laughs> okay, what happens if we don't activate a threat mode of brain at all? It's, 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 that's our um, surviving instinct. 
okay? So it is activated. Usually it is activated. And if it's not activated at all and you feel, don't feel anxious about anything, there might be something about your drive system. So okay. if you're sitting there feeling very low in mood and you're depressed and you have, a, a, for example, an exam coming up or an interview, job interview, and you feel nothing, probably there is an issue. Okay. It might be depression. It might Lack be something energy. else. There are a lot of different explanations. Okay. Again, you know, I, I keep saying, please don't struggle alone. If that's a problem you're struggling with, do come forward and ask for help. We are trained to deal with these things. A lot of thanks. Many thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay. And um, someone is asking, empathy is not pity? It's different. Is there a difference between empathy and pity? Yes. What's the difference between it? So um, it's, it's a very interesting, I don't have the technical word with me now, but empathy is about feeling for, okay, we have sympathy and empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy is about feeling for the other person. Sympathy is about putting yourself in their shoes. About, again, please. So empathy, you feel for the other person. I feel okay. for you. You're struggling and I feel for you. I notice you're suffering and I feel for you. Sympathy, mm -hmm. I feel your emotions and I put myself in your shoes. Self-pity, oh. it's not a positive word necessarily because when you pity somebody, there is a little bit of negative indication to it. <laughs> okay, so that's okay. where weakness comes. Self-pity is, oh, so you're feeling like that? So it's different. But, well, empathy, I feel for you and I respect your dignity, and I feel for you at the same time, and I'm thinking about how to help. So that's more of empathy. That's what we health professionals keep doing, more of empathy, not pity, because oh. we want to encourage our patients to look after themselves. It's more of a collaborative approach. It's more of kind of engaging them in treatment plans. So that's more of empathy, respecting their dignity, and collaborating them in whatever we're doing. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Okay, and another question, what's the difference between empathy and compassion? Empathy and compassion, that's a good, uh, good one. Somebody with <laughs> language <laughs> interest is, is asking yes. questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for the questions. Okay, empathy and compassion. So, um, so empathy, you're feeling for the other person. Compassion, oh. I, I, I honestly cannot explain it in that kind of very, very close because they are very close. They are very close. Um, so compassion is more of uh, so the sensitivity of the suffering. So in compassion, there is, I think, the other bit of wanting to do something about it. So the courage and then wanting to do the intention to relieve the suffering. So not only I feel for you, but also I feel for you and I will do something about it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, uh, terms of the definition, that would be the definition. Yeah. They're okay. very close and they're interlinked. They're, they, they are very kind of, yeah. yeah. So in Arabic, we do not have actually, when I, I, we were doing a study and when we try to actually uh, translate, there is no an Arabic word for compassion. So we said at ta'atuf. Yes. So compassion and empathy in Arabic would be the same word. The same. But in English, you have because the, because compassion gives you more depth to the word and the yeah. So there are more indicate yeah. Okay, okay. One more question. Yes. If Dr. Noor kindly advise us, how can we utilize what we learn today, especially at work with difficult patients? And thank you. Lovely. <laughs> That's really lovely how we can use that with patient because I was very much thinking about ourselves. Um, you know what? We are at our best as health professionals when we bring our hearts to what we do. So it's not only a profession and it's not only a job, but rather we are human looking after other human. And I think that's when we bring compassion. And you know, there is very big difference when you, when, you know, think about yourself, when you go and you see a doctor, it's very different when somebody is just very good in what they're doing and when somebody really care and really look after you. 
when their heart is in the room, not in terms of, you know, we don't want people to be, to be burnt out, but it's, you know how to relate and to make people feel that you look after them. And that kind of, when you bring it to your practice, I think it brings more heart and more quality. And that what makes you a very special doctor. Definitely. Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, somebody's asking about your Instagram, if you have Instagram. That's so lovely. I, I actually, <laughs> people keep telling me I have to get more in social media. I have private, but I don't have professional accounts, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is one... Just to keep the balance, you know, work-life balance. <laughs> there is one, I think it's a comment. Empathy mm. is putting yourself in other person's shoes. What do you think? So that's more of sympathy. <laughs> so empathy is feeling for the other person. Sympathy is feeling their feeling. So you're crying, I'm crying with you. That's sympathy. Empathy, I feel for you, then I am sad. That's more of empathy. Mm -hmm. Compassion is sympathetic uh, pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. It's about feeling for other people, but not pity them. Because if we pity them, you know, we're putting them in a different uh, position. But it's rather about feeling for them and thinking mm -hmm. about how to help them, whether that's self or others. Okay. Thank you so much, Doctora. It Thank was so much. Really very nice and informative, very interesting presentation. Thank you so much for Thank having me. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. I uh, think thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hudun and Dr. Noor. Uh, I'm really so relaxed. Um, so, and I ordered my uh, favorite type of coffee as she advised. It's in the way right now. So at the end of this webinar, I would like to thank our amazing speakers tonight, Dr. Erlado Pesarisi and Dr. Noor Habib for their scientific contribution. And also, I would like to thank Dr. Hudun Qalai for moderating uh, this session with us, uh, with, with me tonight. And I will take the opportunity to announce for our next webinar, which will be on the 21st of July. We will host Prof. John Weeps. He will uh, talk about a very interesting topic uh, about diabetes type 1, what a pediatric dentist must know. I'm so excited to attend that lecture and I think you do so. So please mark your calendar and stay tuned. Uh, you can visit our official webpage for further updates for future activities and also you can uh, follow us on the Twitter page and in the Instagram account. Uh, also you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch the uh, recorded lectures uh, for the previous webinars. If you have any concern or any question, just please feel free to write for us via the email listed uh, in the bottom of the screen. We will be more than happy if you become one of the members of the SSPD family. So please join us and enjoy the benefits of membership by accessing the webpage. Uh, I would like to thank Kunuzi Taj for managing this webinar free of charge. A lot of um, questions was regarding the credit hours. Unfortunately, this lecture has no credit hours, but all of the audience will have uh, and will receive a certificate of attendance. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank the president of the SSPD, the scientific committee, and all the members of the SSPD for their efforts and support. Uh, thank you so much. And remember, do physical distance, but always keep yourself scientifically updated. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. Looking forward to see you soon, inshallah. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night.